Okay, I hope that's working. That yeah, sounds like it. Be here at Riverside. Um, I was recollecting, it's, it's been, it's actually my second visit. The, the last visit, though, is I think over 10 years ago, I came to an APS meeting here. Um, so here's my title for the day, Scanning New Horizons, Entanglement, Holography, and Gravity. Um, these three words uh, in the subtitle may be familiar or they may not, but I'm, I, as part of the talk, I'm going to go through and, and we'll introduce each one of them and then try and tell you how they're tied together. But what I wanted to start with was this. This is sort of an overview of the direction of uh, research that I'm involved in. And it from Qubit, um, well, Jim Simons and the, the Simons Foundation has been increasingly uh, generous to theoretical physics. And so this was the name of a uh, collaboration, uh, the name of a grant application that we came up with. But it actually characterizes a sort of the field or the research direction that, that we are uh, undertaking together. And I want to call it a new collision of ideas. Many of my friends in the collaboration might think of it as a confluence of ideas, or you may want to use the word nexus, or dialogue. But, but I really like the word collision for two reasons. One is it's a good physics word. In physics, we make collisions. We collide particles. We collide masses. Um, but the other thing that's characterized by the picture here is a collision is a time of great excitement. There's all sorts of things flying all over the place. And we're not exactly sure where everything's going to land at the end of the day. And that's very much my sense of what's going on right now in the field of study that I want to describe. Now, the collision that I want to talk about isn't a collision of the cars, but rather they're metaphors. It's a collision of gravity and information theory. And in fact, I'm going to throw in the word quantum to make it even more exciting. So it's a collision of quantum gravity and quantum information theory. And the engine that's really driving that uh, collision is something called holography. Now we, the holography is in quotes there because it's probably not the holography that you think of. But again, I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go along. In any event, I promised that I'd go through the list. And I'm going to go through the list uh, starting with the word gravity. And so I just want to remind you um, what the story of gravity is. And that goes back to our friend Albert Einstein over 100 years ago. and he really changed the way that we think about gravity. And he said that gravity is really all about geometry. And in particular, that the curvature of gravity, or, or the curvature of space-time, is a manifestation of the what we usually think of as the gravitational force. One of the, the key ideas, or the paradigm shift, um, that came with general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, was that we used to think of space-time, or, or space and time, as being a stage on which physical phenomena take place. But what Einstein's theory was telling us is that it's not only a stage, but it's also an active player in the dynamics, or in the physics, of gravity. And so that's a... a characterization, or one of the key features that I would ca uh, characterize, or a distinguishing feature of Einstein's uh, vision of gravity. Of course, it was also this, you know, when you shift the paradigm, you get all sorts of new ideas. Um, and so certainly, uh, general relativity was a source of rich, a rich source of new ideas. We he introduced the idea of black holes, which will be a key player in today's talk. There's also gravitational waves, ripples in the curvature of space-time propagating out. Um, and when we think of cosmology or the entire universe, there was the idea of an expanding universe. The whole uh, space-time is, is, or the cosmology is a result of the expansion of the, our geometry. Now, as well as slogans and new ideas, of course, general relativity has faced or, or come up with detailed calculation, 
that have been tested with exquisite precision with experiments. And so here's a, a list of experiments. And of course, one of the most exciting is the observation just last year of gravitational waves coming from the merger of two different uh, black holes, as shown in, in the data here. Um, so that is sort of an introduction to gravity, per se, but that's classical gravity. I said that, uh, oh, well, OK, general relativity uh, is this geometric arena of physics at very large scales. But what I said is I wanted to think about quantum gravity. And so there, essentially, what I want to do is I want to take general relativity, I want to throw in an h-bar or throw in quantum theory, and then that'll be quantum gravity. Now, what could be so hard about that? Well, if you put 10 uh, researchers working in the field together, uh, you would get 10 different explanations about why that's hard. And I'm going to give you one very simple one, and it goes like this. If we focus on quantum theory, a really important or an interesting feature of that theory is that when we focus our attention on very, very small scales, we see that there are fluctuations uh, due to the quantum nature of the theory that become very, very, or become more and more important. In fact, they, they're observable in experiments. And so one a simple example of that is the magnetic moment of an electron. Dirac's equation says that Electrons have a particular magnetic moment that's characterized by this number g. And according to the Dirac equation, that g is equal to 2. However, if you take into account quantum fluctuations, um, what you will find is that theoretically, you get some number that's not quite 2. It's almost 2, but not quite. And so you get a number that looks like this. But in fact, the clever experimentalists can go out and they can measure that magnetic moment. And what they find is that their experiments also show that it's not quite two, but rather it agrees exquisitely with the theoretical number. The only discrepancies come way out here at 10 significant digits. And it's not that there's really a problem with the theory or the experiment, rather it's that the theorists have only calculated accurately to this order, and the experimentalists have only invested in their experiments to be able to measure accurately to that order. If we wanted to invest more money in the experiments or more time in the theory, what we expect is that that agreement would carry on. But the key idea here is that this is a quantum effect, that fluctuations in the relevant uh, fields or the relevant quantities, the electromagnetic field, in uh, the positions or, or the properties of the electron are producing this small shift away from Dirac's prediction of two to this uh, number that I've shown on the screen there. Now, if you think about general relativity then, well, what is it that's going to fluctuate? Well, in fact, it's the space-time geometry itself. And so the problem, a problem, is going to be that when we focus our attention on very, very short distance scales in gravity, what we'll find is not a smooth space time, a smooth stage on which physics is taking place, but rather a wildly fluctuating uh, geometry that forms some kind of messy spaghetti like this. And then the question becomes, well, how do we make sense of space time or this uh, framework uh, at all. And again, if you put the 10 theorists together, you'll get 10 different ideas on how to make progress. But I can characterize them in two different ways. One is that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to modify our ideas about geometry at very short distance scales. And the other idea is that we're going to have to modify the spectrum, or we're going to have to say there's more than just gravity. There are other excitations, other particles in the theory. Um, perhaps uh, strings. Now, different people have different ideas, and they're working very hard on those ideas. It's an unsolved problem. But I hope that today, the kinds of ideas that I'm going to be talking about are universal. Um, they're talking more, or they're, they're extracting more about long distance physics or the consequences of short distance quantum gravity for the long distance physics. 
And, and I hope that irrespective of the details of how we make sense or how we solve this problem, uh, the, the discussion that I give today will have some impact on it. So that was my lightning review or introduction to uh, quantum gravity. Um, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, one of those words up there, entanglement, or really quantum entanglement. And so this is a very simple idea in quantum theory. It's saying that if I have a system that has many different parts, those many different parts in quantum theory can be correlated simply by the fact that there's a single wave function that describes all of those different parts together. And so the famous uh, example is the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, where what they were thinking about was a single atom that emits two different photons in opposite directions. And no matter how far apart our experimenters, Alice and Bob, make their measurements, what they find are that the polarizations of those two different photons are always correlated. And Einstein called this uh, spooky action at a distance. And EPR had actually been working on this thought experiment because what they wanted to do was show that there was some fundamental flaw or incompleteness in quantum theory. But now what we do is we recognize that entanglement is really an essential feature. It's what makes the quantum world different than the classical world. And it's really the quantum information theorists that have embraced this idea. And what entanglement for them is, is it's a resource. It's an essential feature of the systems that they work with that enables ultra-fast computations or ultra-secure communications. But in physics, we've also seen um, entanglement becoming important. In particular, in condensed matter physics, it's seen as a key to describe certain exotic phases of matter, uh, such as quantum Hall fluids or certain unconventional superconductors or things known as uh, quantum spin fluids. But what I want to, the message I want to send today is that there are other areas of physics where we're starting to realize entanglement plays an important role in shaping uh, the physics there. In particular, quantum field theory and quantum gravity, which I talked about already. Well, I didn't talk about the entanglement, but that's the story of today's lecture. Um, so let's give this a try. This was the EPR wave function, and I said that it's entangled. Here are two other wave functions, and what I've done is I've made the wave functions more complicated by sticking in other stuff that wasn't there in this wave function. And in fact, the only difference between those two is a sign that appears here. But as a consequence of that, if you fool around with this, what you'll see is that this is actually a product state. There's no entanglement in this wave function. On the other hand, just by flipping that sign there, it turns out that this state is entangled. Now, if I'm given two spins or two polarizations, it's easy to fool around and decide at the end of the day whether or not your wave function or your state is entangled or not. But in the systems that I'm talking about, there are going to be many, many, many degrees of freedom. And so we want some other diagnostic that's going to tell us when there's entanglement present and when there isn't. And if there is entanglement present, it'd be useful to know, you know, to get a number or a feeling of how much entanglement there is. And so it turns out that the uh, hero of the day is something known as entanglement entropy. Um, now, entropy is a familiar uh, idea. We see it all the way back in first year. We, uh, it's introduced originally in thermodynamics, where it's a quantity that quantifies heat losses or the efficiency of, of uh, engines. Um, Later on, we learn that that same quantity is actually in STATMEC. It's, it's characterizing our uncertainty about the microstate or the microscopic degrees of freedom of the system. 
It turns out that in information theory, entropy also is a useful concept. And there, for example, it can be used to quantify the amount of information in a message or in a word. Um, on the other hand, what I'm talking about is something known as entanglement entropy. And this is an idea that I will uh, say comes from the quantum information theorists. It's really an extension of the information theory ideas. But it's a general diagnostic where we're using entropy uh, to give us a measure of the correlations between different parts of our favorite quantum system. Um, and so it gives us a measure of the entanglement uh, in that system. And one thing to note is that it's in, if you go read a, a quantum information book, this is only one possible diagnostic. But for the physics I'm going to talk about today, it seems to play the prominent role, entanglement entropy, uh, as opposed to any of the other different choices uh, that we might find in our textbook. Um, so let's see how that works. Um, here are our wave functions again. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to divide the system into two subsystems. So that can be our two polarizations. Um, a and B, we trace out or we trace over one of the sets of degrees of freedom. So we can trace out one of the spins. What's left is a density matrix that describes the remaining spin or the remaining degrees of freedom. And given that density matrix, we apply the usual von Neumann formula. Trace rho log rho, we throw in a minus sign, and that's an entropy. In this particular case, that's what's called the entanglement entropy. So you can apply that for these different states here. And what you find is for this EPR wave function that you get a density matrix that looks like this. And if you apply that formula there, you get a log two. Um, for, well, if there are any quantum information theorists in, in the room, I'm getting a log two here because my logarithms are base E rather than base two. Um, but this is essentially one bit or qubits worth of entanglement. Similarly, playing that game here leads us to zero entanglement entropy, whereas this final state here has, again, a log two or one qubits worth of entanglement. So that, again, is applying this idea to a very simple system. What we'd like to do is apply it to a more complicated system. In particular, I'd like to apply it in the context of quantum field theory. And so what am I going to do there? Well, what we do there is the first thing we do is we focus our attention on a Cauchy surface or a time slice. And we're going to use the field configurations on this time slice as characterizing the space of states. I'm supposed to divide the system into two. And so what we do is we introduce an arbitrary boundary on our time slice that divides it into an inside and an outside. I trace over the degrees of freedom on the outside. That gives me a density matrix that describes what's left, the, the, degrees, the field theory degrees of freedom on the inside of my surface. And then I apply this formula. And again, that's what we call uh, the entanglement entropy. There's a, a slight problem with that, which is that I know right away what the answer to this question is going to be. It's going to be infinity. And that arises because in quantum field theory, there are actually an infinite number of degrees of freedom. But in particular, at very, very short distance scales or arbitrarily short wavelengths, I'll find more and more degrees of freedom. And what this calculation is dominated by, then, is short range correlations just in the vicinity of this boundary surface, this sigma surface. And so to make sense of that calculation, we have to regulate which essentially means I'm going to sh throw away the shortest wavelength. There's going to be a minimum wavelength or a short distance cutoff that I call delta. And then if I do the calculation in the regulated system, uh, what I find is that the entanglement entropy is given by the ratio of some macroscopic scale that characterizes the geometry over the cutoff to various powers. And those powers are controlled by the dimension of the space-time. I'm a string theorist, so I like to think about theories in any number of space-time dimensions. We happen to live in three plus one, or four dimensions. Um, but it's equally uh, 
interesting to think about lower dimensions, perhaps three dimensions, or for string theorists to think about higher dimensions, perhaps five, six, or higher. Um, in fact, if I do this calculation, not just for one shape here, but for many, many shapes, what we find is that these coefficients have an elegant geometric interpretation. And in fact, this first one I can think of as the area of that surface sigma divided by the cutoff to the appropriate power. So if I'm in d equals 4, this is a delta squared, and that really is the area. So my surface could be a sphere, or it will be a sphere later in the talk. And so this would be the area of the sphere divided by the cutoff squared. And similarly, there are various geometric interpretations of these higher coefficients where I'm integrating geometric quantities over the surface. And as a result of uh, the dimensions of this quantity, the, the curvature or these geometric quantities, I, I get to reduce the, the power of the cutoff. The only thing that I really want you to take away from this whole discussion is that in quantum field theory, we think about dividing up the geometry with surfaces and that the entanglement entropy, the leading order, is given by the area divided by something, the short distance cutoff to the appropriate power to make a dimensionless number. Uh, and that's the essential message here. Um, so here we are again at our collision. I've talked a little bit about quantum gravity. I've talked a little bit about uh, I ideas, entanglement entropy coming from quantum information. Um, the next thing would be to talk about holography, but I'm going to come at that sideways. Rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a historical look at where this collision that I'm talking about originated. And in fact, to talk about or to, to think about the origin of this collision, in fact, it's not something that happened uh, in the past few years, but we get to go back all the way to 1972. Um, and, well, I know where I was in 1972. Many of you may not have been born. Uh, you, you can all decide where you were. Those of you who were around may remember 1972 as the year in which uh, the digital watch was invented. Um, this watch actually sold for over $1,000. Uh, that wasn't a great business model, given that the price went down to roughly $10 uh, within a couple years. Um, there was some new uh, uh, paradigm shifting things happening on TV. Um, the first successful video, commercially successful video game came out in 1972. Uh, and the first Star Trek convention was held in New York City in 1972. What we're interested in, though, is something that was happening down the road from the Star Trek convention in a place called Princeton, New Jersey. And there, a young fellow, unfortunately, I, didn't, I couldn't find a picture of the young version of Jacob Beckenstein, but he was a young grad student uh, finishing up his PhD at Princeton. And he had this idea that uh, black holes should have an entropy. And in fact, that that entropy would be characterized by the area of the event horizon. And he really, uh, I mean, this came the following year. This was a paper, a follow-up paper that he wrote. But he really wanted to think about the physics of black holes using the perspective of information theory. So he was really the first pioneer to try and bring gravity and information theory together. And this is what he came up with. And in fact, that was actually at the time a radical departure from our usual perspective of black holes. Um, remember that in Einstein's gravity, black holes are a region where the curvature of the space-time is so great that nothing gets to escape. Uh, the boundary between uh, what can escape and what can't is called the event horizon, and that's uh, what played a role in that formula. But in 1972, black holes were really a playground for mathematical physicists. Um, they weren't movie stars. Uh, that's gargantuan in interstellar. 
they were not powerhouses. They were, they were not thought about by astrophysicists. Now, if astrophysicists need a process with lots of energy, you know, a workhorse that comes into play very often is a black hole. Rather, in 1972, these were just, you know, very elegant solutions of the Einstein equation. And Chandrasekhar characterized them in this way. They were the most perfect macroscopic objects that there are in the universe. The only elements in their construction are the concepts of space and time. Now, what Mr. Bekenstein was saying is that hidden there in those equations or in that geometry was an entropy which suggested not an elegant, smooth solution, but that there's some kind of uh, extra structure hidden that nobody could detect or nobody could understand um, at that time. And so his idea that there should be an entropy associated with black holes met with uh, strong opposition, let's say. But in fact, it melted away just a couple of years afterward when this gentleman here, Stephen Hawking, told us that black holes are, or told everybody that black holes are not quite as black as we thought, rather that when you take into account quantum fluctuations, that the black holes actually leak. They emit what looks like black body radiation with a particular temperature given by this formula, where this kappa is, again, uh, some geometric structure that's associated with the black hole solution. And given that, uh, well, thermal kind of behavior, it was natural then to um, associate an entropy uh, with the black hole. And in fact, the equations naturally, given that temperature, associated an entropy. One of the nice things is that Jacob uh, in his formula, he had some arbitrary numerical constant sitting here. But given this result here uh, by Hawking, uh, what we realized, it, or what they realized, uh, is that the equations demanded that constant was just the fraction, one quarter. And so we're now around 1974. Um, everybody realized that uh, black holes have an entropy given by this elegant formula here. Um, and in fact, it became a watering hole, or it was seen as a watering hole for lots of different kinds of physics. In particular, you have an area that speaks to geometry, you've got the speed of light, speaks to relativity, you've got uh, Boltzmann's constant for thermal physics, an h-bar for quantum theory, and of course, it's a black hole, it's gravity, and so you have Newton's constant there. Um, and in particular, we see h-bars and g's together, or quantum and gravity together, and so it was long thought uh, that this uh, formula should be a window uh, into the nature of the quantum theory of gravity, or of quantum gravity. One of the things it certainly tells us, or, oh, that was exciting, one of the things it reminds us is that when you put together all of the, uh, those coupling, or all of those constants of nature, that what you get in a theory of quantum gravity is a fundamental length scale, something known as the Planck length. And so if we take this particular combination of Newton's constant h-bar and the speed of light, that gives us a length squared. And so what we're doing here in this formula or what Becken, uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula is doing, is it's essentially measuring the horizon in units of the Planck length squared. Now, one uh, thing is that there is this annoying constant that we didn't use up, uh, Boltzmann's constant. Um, and what that's reminding us of is that the people who invented entropy um, were really, well, they weren't interested in black holes, they were interested in devices like this, and they were concerned with heat and work losses. And so what this is, uh, uh, well, what that's doing is it's giving us units here. Um, and in fact, much of the early discussion of black holes and this formula had to do uh, with processes in which one decided how much 
uh, the energy, how much energy was put into the system, how much the temperature changed, how much the entropy changed. And it was really a discussion that was phrased in the framework of thermodynamics. And so it was a field that was known as black hole thermodynamics. But often what we do as theorists is we set uh, Boltzmann's constant to one and we think of the entropy as a dimensionless quantity. And that's really what happens in the framework where we think of statistical mechanics. And we think that what we're doing is we're measuring some kind of uncertainty uh, about the microstates or the microphysics. And so in this case, what this formula should be telling us about is it should be telling us something about the microstates or the quantum gravity states that come together to make that black hole there. And so there's something really cool in that formula in that here's information about the microstates or about the quantum gravity, but on this side, what's happening is that information is encoded in the space-time geometry. It's encoded in the area of this special uh, surface known as the horizon. Now, one of the things is that I talked about, or this is an entropy, and it's, it's got a geometry there, but that geometry is an area. Whereas in thermodynamics, we usually think that the entropy is an extensive quantity. It's something that grows with the volume. But here we're getting something that grows with the area. And that's rather unusual from the perspective of thermodynamics. But we've already seen in this talk a place where we had something called an entropy that grew like an area, namely in entanglement entropy. And it was Raphael Sorkin who back in 1984 suggested that perhaps the origin of this entropy here was in fact this entanglement entropy that I talked about before. Raphael actually had a tougher time in that he was working at a time when people didn't put the words entanglement and entropy in the same sentence, let alone the same paragraph. And so he was really inventing uh, this quantity. And he did a calculation that we now recognize as the calculation that I described earlier. And the quantity that he was talking about is the quantity that we recognize as the entanglement entropy. Um, so it does seem then that entanglement entropy may be related to black holes and black hole microphysics. Um, really, uh, well, the formula I had before had an area of some surface that divided an inside and an outside. The horizon is a natural surface that divides the inside from the outside of a black hole. Um, the formula I had before had some arbitrary cutoff. Here I've got some small distance scale that came out of the theory, the quantum theory of gravity. And so it might be, or it's very suggestive that this formula and this formula could be the same if we could associate this cutoff with that short distance scale that naturally appears in the quantum gravity theory. Sure. Right. Um, uh, yes and no. You don't, you don't actually need mountains and valleys to have curvature. A sphere is a nice, smooth geometry. It's homogeneous, and it's got curvature. But, but yeah, I've left a dot, dot, dot here. Here I don't have a dot, 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 but actually if you go beyond Einstein gravity and you think about higher curvature interactions, you will fill in a bunch of terms here and they have an, an analog or, or they make a complete connection with the terms there. Um, so there, well, I, I, I didn't include that part of the discussion. It's, it's, it's sort of a detail because unfortunately I can't say that this is the end of the story here. Um, what we understand is that this calculation that was done or that I described is sort of part of that answer, but it's not the whole answer. Um, and it's really still an open question. Um, we really need a handle on those microscopic degrees of freedom in our quantum gravity theory 
to really understand uh, the details of you know, this coefficient appearing there in precisely that particular way. Um, and different people, again, have different approaches. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, well, there is a, a sense in the field that, that entanglement entropy really is going to be the source uh, when we uh, nail things down at this microscopic level. Um, perhaps I should pause there and ask if there are other questions. Okay, if not, I'll just continue with my story. So, so this isn't a complete story, um, but it's a very suggestive one. We understand part of it, but not the whole story. Um, and in fact, my description is only a part of a bigger picture. Um, what it was saying was that there's some information about the microstates that's encoded in the horizon geometry. Um, but it's actually uh, only a part of this idea that the black hole behaves like a thermal system. And what these two heroes here did, this is Gerard de Tuft and Lenny Susskind up at Stanford, is they suggested that there was actually a, a more complete story where the horizon just doesn't just encode some information that doesn't just count the number of states, but actually that the horizon is actually the home of some dual or some holographic theory that's going to describe the entire dynamics and evolution of this three-dimensional object uh, from the perspective of this two-dimensional surface. Um, there were, again, a lot of suggestive calculations or arguments that were made, but this uh, particular version of holography didn't make, uh, well, it, it made some headway, but it, it didn't give the exciting story that I'm talking about here. That really had to wait for holography version 2.0, which is also known as the ADS-CFT correspondence. So that was the invention of this gentleman, Juan Maldacena, in 1987. And here what we do is we change the framework. Um, here we talk about gravity with a negative cosmological constant. Uh, the simplest uh, the solution of the geometry there is something known as ADS or anti de Sitter space. So that's the ADS. Um, on the other side, I have a quantum field theory. It's not only any quantum field theory, but a quantum field theory without any intrinsic scales. Those are known as conformal field theories, and so that's the CFT of this correspondence. One of the things of note, though, is that this gravity theory lives in d plus one dimensions, whereas the boundary theory only lives in d dimensions. So this quantum field theory really lives in one dimension less. You can think of it as living on the boundary of this big space where the gravity theory describes the interior. And so hence, again, we see this holographic feature that we're describing the physics of uh, a gravitational system in one higher dimension with some uh, quantum field theory or some other theory without gravity that lives on the boundary. Now I can take that and I can, uh, or what these two gentlemen did is they mashed it together, that version of holography with entanglement entropy. What they said is, well, there I have a quantum field theory, namely this boundary conformal field theory. And so this is the picture that I drew before, but it's really now a picture that lives on the boundary of my uh, anti de Sitter space. And the question becomes, how do I evaluate this entanglement entropy for that region A? And well, you know, I could use, or I could try and use uh, the techniques that are, are available to calculate entanglement entropy, but they're very, very difficult to apply. And so what they did is they said, I can take advantage of this correspondence between gravity and quantum field theory to turn this into a geometric uh, discussion. And in particular, what they suggested is, so in my cartoon, this was the boundary of the space this blank area down here is the interior of the space. And what their prescription is, is I'm supposed to think of every surface that hangs down into the bulk and ends on that blue boundary, the boundary of A. 
Then on all of these surfaces, V, I evaluate the area, I divide by four times Newton's constant, and I find the surface that has the minimal area. And it turns out, or their claim is, that this quantity evaluated on the minimal surface uh, gives us the entanglement entropy of that uh, particular region up there in the boundary conformal field theory. Now, you may recognize this, of course. This is the Bekenstein Hawking formula that I talked about before. That's something to do with entropy, I claim. And so that's kind of a neat idea that I'm now talking about entanglement entropy in a quantum field theory and relating it to this interesting uh, gravitational uh, formula. But it was really something that in 2006 was like uh, a rabbit being pulled out of a magician's hat. Um, it sort of came out of nowhere. Nobody was thinking about entanglement entropy in this community at the time. And uh, in, in fact, it, it described a collision in that Tadashi was a string theorist, whereas Shinsei was a condensed matter theorist. And it's when they put their heads together that they came up with this particular uh, idea here. What do you do when you, uh, well, have an idea like that? One of the things that we did was, well, we, we uh, applied many consistency tests. So entanglement entropy, if I go to my quantum information textbooks, satisfies a certain set of consist or, uh, properties. And you can then uh, take that, ask if this geometric formula satisfies that same set of properties. And if it does, you say, well, OK, there's a consistency test that this is behaving in the appropriate way to be an entanglement entropy. And so th this went on for uh, over six years, where essentially what was happening was the string theorists were learning more and more uh, quantum information or more and more about entanglement entropy and finding that this particular geometric formula seemed to satisfy every test that we could throw at it. And it was only in recent times, or a few years ago, that the first proof uh, actually was given that this particular quantity in the gravity theory is equal to this particular quantity in the boundary theory. And essentially what they did is they took the standard or a standard calculation of this in the boundary theory and carefully translated it to the geometric language and they were able to show that the geometry, what, with that translation, you ended up with this uh, prescription here. So since then, or, or at that time, uh, holographic entanglement entropy then became an interesting forum for a dialogue between the physics of the bulk and the physics of the boundary. And that went both ways in that we could use this new formula to learn new things about the boundary theory or about quantum field theories. Um, and an example of that that I wanted to tell you about has to do with renormalization group flows and something known as C-theorems. So, yep. Th this is proven, uh, so, so anti de Sitter is the simplest solution, but it's proven uh, for more general solutions, but you're right in that it, they're all solutions of Einstein's equations with a negative cosmological constant. The, uh, well, okay, this, this prescription was a prescription that's coming up in the context of ADS-CFT. We can try and uh, generalize that to other particular contexts, perhaps no cosmological constant or a positive cosmological constant like we seem to observe. Um, that, uh, and, and that is a research direction. It's something that people try and do. But what I'm going to try and tell you about is how, or what we've learned from this formula in that particular framework. And in particular, what I'm going to show you is we've learned new things about quantum field theories, and perhaps quantum field theories that you might be interested in as a condensed matter physicist. So let's see how that works. Well, it was quite a jump to go from gravity, holography, 
the renormalization group flow. So I just wanted to remind you, you know, renormalization is a relatively simple idea. If we have a system that's made out of microscopic constituents, a system that's made out of microscopic constituents, um, those constituents can come together to produce new collective effects um, at very large distance scales. So that's a pictorial representation of what, what might happen. But of course, we're applying this idea, or renormalization, get, well, it actually goes back to the 19th century when it was discussed in the context, uh, perhaps not with this set of words, but in the context of uh, turbulence. But where we're applying it is in the context of quantum field theory, where renormalization or the renormalization group is a math precise mathematical apparatus that allows us to discuss how the description of the quantum field theory changes when you view it from different energy scales or different length scales. And in particular, how the effects of the short distance physics can be absorbed into a few parameters that describe the, phys uh, the physics at low energies or at longer wavelengths. Um, and in particular, then, renormalization group flows um, describe how the, those parameters are changing as you in methodically integrate out uh, degrees of freedom at different length scales. So here's a cartoon. This is supposed to be a two-dimensional space of couplings. So there might be a, a G1 axis here, a G2 axis here. If I start uh, at a certain energy scale, and I stay, start integrating out energies, uh, the couplings change in a very precise way, and they flow down uh, to this spot here. That spot, or the red dots in my cartoon, are very special places. They're fixed points. They're places where the flow is stationary, or they're places where the flow goes to or from, or, or uh, uh, well, they're, they're very special, uh, they represent very special um, field theories. They're, in fact, theories without any scales, so you might characterize them as these conformal field theories that I talked about before, or uh, in another language, they're associated with critical phenomena. Now, now something uh, I talked about, or the other word I talked about with C theorems, this goes back to Zamologikov's work. Um, almost 30 years ago, what he was doing was studying quantum field theories and renormalization group flows for two-dimensional uh, quantum field theories. And what he found was essentially that there was a new quantity, this C function, that was a function on the space of couplings. It satisfies all sorts of interesting properties here, but essentially what it did is it takes this particular cartoon here and turns it into this landscape here. And essentially, this C function is something that gives an elevation to my cartoon. And each different uh, field theory lives at a different elevation. The fixed points are the valleys and the peaks, or the saddles, the, the mountain passes in the landscape. And the RG flows take us be be between those two points, but they always flow downhill. At the fixed points, that C function is a very special number that's associated with uh, the uh, conformal field theory known as the central charge. And a simple consequence of all this structure is that the central charge that I find at the fixed point at one end is at the, well, at the top end, at the UV or the high energy end, is always bigger than the central charge at the infrared or the low energy end of the RG flow. Now, that is something that applies for two dimensions. A natural question is, does anything similar ha happen for quantum field theories in higher dimensions? For example, in four or three plus one space-time dimensions. To make progress there, you have to decide, well, how does C you know, come into play in the quantum field theory, in the two-dimensional quantum field theories? <laughs> one thing, it, it actually comes in in all sorts of different places, but one place it comes in is in what's known as the trace anomaly up there. If I have a quantum field theory or a conformal field theory and I evaluate the trace of the stress tensor 
in the vacuum, what I'm supposed to get is zero. That's a defining feature or characteristic of conformal field theories. But if I take my theory and put it on a smooth, ge uh, a curved geometry rather than a flat in flat space, I won't quite get zero, but I'll get something that involves the geometry on the other side. There I've got some curvature, that R. And then there's a proportionality constant, and that proportionality constant is the central charge of the theory. I can do the same thing in four dimensions. The only thing is that in four dimensions, there are more interesting features in the geometry, so there are more uh, various terms that I can write down on that side, and there are various proportionality constants that are associated with each one. And so rather than having a single central charge, we end up with four uh, numbers that characterize the underlying conformal field theory. And the question is, does any one of these satisfy an inequality like that when I'm looking at RG flows? Well, it was very quickly established uh, that the first one and the last one don't work. And that leaves us with this central charge or this quantity called A. And it was actually John Carty who first proposed that it should satisfy a theorem. Since it's A rather than C, it's called the A theorem. And there was a lot of theoretical progress towards proving that or finding evidence for it in different contexts. Um, however, that progress stalled at a certain point, and in particular, there was a counterexample that appeared in the literature. And so people didn't think that this was true uh, for general theories or beyond two dimensions. However, what I am happy to report is that there's really been a resurgence recently of interest and rapid progress uh, for thinking about C theorems in higher dimensions. Um, and it stems uh, from holography. And so this is some work that I did with Aninda Sinha. What we were doing was looking at our G flows in various holographic models or in various extensions of ADS CFT. Um, and what we found was there was a some quantity that we gave the unfortunate name AD star. And so here's an example of some formula. And it always satisfied an inequality like this, so that it was bigger at the high energy end than at the low energy end of our holographic RG flow. But this formula really is a gravitational formula. All of those parameters in that formula are couplings in some gravitational theory. This F is just, I mean, it, at the end of the day, gets uh, replaced by some complicated formula here because it's the, uh, I have to solve this equation for a root and plug it back up there and you get some complicated mess, but it's really a gravitational formula. And the question that we faced was what does this really mean in the context of the boundary theory? How is this the answer to a question in the conformal field theory that lives on the boundary? Um, one of the things we were able to show was that when the boundary theory was even dimensional, by which I mean even space time, so again, we live in four dimensions, um, that it actually corresponded to a particular coefficient that appears in the trace anomaly. And so this is very much like what I was talking about before. And in fact, it agrees with John Carty's conjecture, um, which actually applies for general even dimensions. So this is the A of the A theorem. And so this is in agreement with his conjecture. Um, but this whole structure actually applies both for odd dimensions and even dimensions. In odd dimensions, there is no trace anomaly. And so this context or this framework isn't a way to describe that formula. But instead, what we were able to show was that there's a particular entanglement entropy calculation that gives us that particular coefficient. And so what you have to do is you have to think about a very special surface, a sphere, that's dividing the inside and the outside, and then the universal contribution has that particular coefficient. And so that was actually quite, rem or well, we thought that was really neat, because now we, for the first time, we're talking about C theorems, not just in even dimensions, but odd dimensions, and we've kind of unified them in, the con or in this framework of entanglement entropy. As I said before, this agrees with Cardi's conjecture for the, um, for the even dimensional case. 
And although our work was done in the context of holography, we conjectured that this should be a result that applies for field theories even outside of that particular context. Um, so then there was some work that followed our work, uh, some friends at Princeton uh, in three dimensions or in any odd number of dimensions had a different construction and they found evidence that for a C theorem using their construction. Um, we had actually shown or I'd shown with those folks there that uh, our entanglement entropy approach and their approach was, were actually one and the same that you could translate between the two. But even more exciting, a, a year or two later, uh, these folks were actually able to prove in the context of three dimensions that this new C theorem was actually a general result that applies for any, well, unitary Lorentz invariant uh, quantum field theory. And so what we have then is we started by playing around with exotic theories of gravity bringing in the ideas of entanglement entropy and we come up with a general truth or a new fact about quantum field theories in two plus one dimensions. I should add at this point that there's also now a proof of the A theorem or the equivalent thing in, in four dimensions but that has no, at, at, at present we don't know of any connection with in, uh, of that proof with uh, sort of quantum information ideas, um, it was using more conventional uh, field theory techniques. So that's an example then how holography teaches us new things about quantum field theory, but the dialogue actually goes the, way, the, the opposite way as well. We've learned new things about uh, the gravity theory or the bulk theory, and in particular an idea that's come out uh, is that entanglement, this quantum, uh, or this feature of quantum theory, is an essential uh, ingredient in the emergence of this extra dimension uh, of space-time. And it was really Mark Van Ramsdonk who first, uh, well, focused our attention on that particular idea. There are all sorts of evidences or, or uh, related ideas um, that uh, sort of focus our attention on this slogan that space-time geometry is entanglement or that entanglement is an ingredient, an essential ingredient in the space-time geometry that we see in ADS space. I, I'm not going to go into any of the details there. Rather, I want to remind you about this uh, a uh, feature that Einstein brought our attention to, that the space-time is not just the stage for physical phenomena, but also an agent in the physics or in the gravitational dynamics. And I want to show you that entanglement actually has something to say in this particular direction as well. Um, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift my attention from entanglement entropy to something called relative entropy. It's a, a related diagnostic. It's, it's one of those things that you'll find in the quantum information textbook. But in this particular case, we've got two different density matrices or two different states. And so there's going to be a reference state, rho naught, and there's going to be a per, what I'll call, well, there's a, a second state, but in our context, we can think of it as an excited state um, or a, a state that's perturbed away from rho naught. Um, I'm going to take that reference state and I'm basically going to redefine rho naught or I'm going to take the logarithm of it and define something that's called the modular Hamiltonian. It turns out then that if I look at small perturbations away from the reference state, the entanglement entropy doesn't change or the relative entropy doesn't change and this or that vanishing of the first derivative can be expressed in this particular way here. It's something that looks like the first law. There's something that looks like a Hamiltonian on this side and something that looks like an entropy on that side. And if this was, if my reference state was a thermal state with a real exponential e to the minus h over temperature, that would be the first law. However, in general, when I'm cutting up my uh, space-time into chunks and just doing these quantum field theory calculations of an entanglement entropy, 
that density matrix doesn't have a simple construction or a simple form like this, and the modular Hamiltonian turns out to be a big mess, even though we call it a, a Hamiltonian and it has nice formal properties, when I think of what it actually is, it's just, uh, well, not very appealing. However, in special cases, uh, the modular Hamiltonian has a simple form, and in particular, when the quantum field theory is a CFT and the entangling surface is a sphere, uh, it turns out that the modular Hamiltonian has this form here. This is the energy density, and so it's the energy density, or it really is an energy in this region. However, it's sort of modulated by some geometric factor that's related to the position uh, within that uh, sphere. Um, so in that particular case, this formula starts to make more sense in that I have a concrete expression that I can plug in over there. Now, what does that look like when I talk about um, holography? Well, in holography, this had to do with an energy. In, en in gravity, energy is something that you measure at infinity. And so it has something to do with the geometry of the space-time near the boundary of my ADS space. On the other hand, we had the Ru Takinagi formula for the entanglement entropy, and that was related to some surface that dove down from the boundary deep into the bulk of the ADS geometry. Now, these little wiggle, you know, if I just have the vacuum, what I have is empty ADS space. These little colorful wiggles are deformations of that geometry. And so, in this particular case, what that's telling us is there's some strange relation between the geometry on this surface and the geometry that I measure near infinity. That's some kind of unusual non-local geometry. It's not particularly informative, but what makes it informative is if we don't just think about one particular sphere on the boundary, but we think about all possible spheres of all different sizes, all different positions, then you can actually take that non-local constraint on the geometry and you can turn it into a local constraint. And what it says is that you can't deform the geometry in any particular way that you want. Rather, you can only deform it in a way where it satisfies the Einstein equation. And so what that's telling us is that this constraint that comes from quantum information or from entanglement well, what I said before is that entanglement was an ingredient that sort of was essential to constructing the space-time, but it's also then pointing us towards a particular kind of gravitational dynamics. And so you see that entanglement knows bo about both halves of Einstein's maxim here, or max, uh, Einstein's perspective on gravitational physics. So that's a, a new perspective that we've learned about from holography. More generally, then, what I s was telling you is that uh, quantum information, the tools of quantum information are giving us new insights, new perspective on both quantum field theory and on gravity. And the hope is that it may be a tool or a key to unlocking the solution of the problem of quantum field th or quantum gravity, rather. So it could be that what we want is not just quantum gravity, but something like a quantum infogravity. Um, I also said, though, that it's, a, it's not a story that's been completed. It's a work in progress. There's lots of exciting things going on. And so I will close by saying, stay tuned. Uh, there are many new developments that are going to come. So thank you for your attention.